All right. <clears throat> Welcome everyone to our first virtual panel discussion. I am Mary Alice Garza, co-chair of the City of Plano Multicultural Outreach Roundtable. The other co-chairs are Graciela Katz and Shaheen Salam. In partnership with the Plano International Festival, we have sponsored an annual business reception and panel discussion each year. This year, we had to pivot and present a virtual event I want to thank all of those who have supported us in this effort. The City of Plano staff has given us many hours of help. The Junior League of Collin County for supporting attendees in the chat room, the panelists and the moderator who will be helping us a little later on. MCOR is an advisory committee to the City of Plano. We plan activities to help people get to know one another and highlight topics of interest. Our newest subcommittee is on law enforcement to foster more dialogue between all parties. Participation in MCOR or any subcommittee is open to everyone. MCOR generally meets the second Tuesday of the month at City Hall. And now here is our agenda. We will have a welcome from Mayor Munns, followed by a presentation by Linda Adler to the Plano International Festival, and then Kyle Ray, will introduce himself and the panel. Welcome this evening. We hope to see you in person next year. Thank you, Mary Alice. Good evening. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this annual business leadership webinar on behalf of the City of Plano. Tonight's panel discussion on celebrating agility and ingenuity in the community includes a robust slate of panelists who as leaders in our community have great perspectives to share with you. I wanna thank Mark Israelson with the City of Plano, Sarah Bonzer with PISD, Brad Stewart with North Texas Food Bank, and Josh Florin with the Texas Health Presbyterian Hospital for taking time to participate on the panel tonight. You know, for, for nearly 20 years, MCOR has partnered with the City Council to encourage cultural conversations in Plano. The Plano International Festival was born out of MCOR. And these conversations are important and members of these groups help add to the rich fabric of our community by providing varied opportunities for us to learn about each other and hopefully to come to a better appreciation of our cultural diversity. Our citizens embrace diversity. I think we're all proud to live in a community where diversity and inclusion are a priority. Our city is stronger because of this, and this is one of the many reasons we are known as the city of excellence. Again, thank you for the work you're doing. I hope you all enjoy the conversation tonight, and now I'll pass it on to the next speaker. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Hi, everyone. My name is Linda Adler. I am vice president of the Plano International Festival. And I'm happy to be here with our president, Graciela Katzer, and various board members. So I'd like to take you on a quick tour of what the festival is all about and uh, just a little bit of background. So on the slides, I think we have um, a bit of a, a little graphic here for you with a question. It's a pop quiz of sorts. So um, on the next slide, um, you'll see pictures of um, cricket players in Russell Creek Park, there we go, and table tennis in our rec centers, and of course the International Festival, and what do all of those things have in common? If you were listening carefully, I think you know the answer. They were all started by MCOR. So MCOR, as Mary Alice stated, was started many years ago, actually in 2002, so almost 20 years ago, as a way to advise the city council of the diverse needs of the communities of Plano, because we are such an incredibly diverse community. And so besides the festival, the uh, um, organization of MCOR hosts lots of educational and uh, fellowship activities like community circles, citizenship workshop, and national day of prayer. And then of course, our big event is in October in Haggard Park, the Plano International Festival. So let's go on just a quick, quick tour of what the festival is all about. We feature music and dance performances, cultural displays, and food. 
Um, among all of those items, we feature over 100 cultures every October, and it's a wonderful thing. Hands-on activities for kids. We even have a fitness and wellness fair for uh, people to receive health services and screenings right on site at the festival. And it's so important for underserved communities who probably don't have easy access to good health services. So that's one way we give back to the community. And a way that we start every festival is with a naturalization ceremony. Over the course of the festival, we're in our 17th year now, we have naturalized over 700 new citizens. And it's always a very moving and wonderful part of the event. So how do we make all of this happen? We actually have a whole list of sponsors and partners to thank. Um, we work with sponsors throughout the community and media partners and community partners to help bring various aspects of the festival to the community. And we're very thankful to have Mayor Munns be our honorary chair this year. So thank you, Mr. Mayor. And please, um, Save the date on your calendar for our festival on October 9th. As of now, we are still planning on having the festival, but we are monitoring the pandemic situation carefully and closely, and we will provide updates if anything changes. So next, um, we have a few lead up events to the festival. There's an art exhibit happening at the Courtyard Theater with a um, reception or some kind of ceremony to choose the best artists and the best artwork. We have the festival, our fitness and wellness fair, and our dancing with the symphony program. And those three things will all happen on October 9th. So thank you so much for your attention. And please, if you want to get involved, we can always use help with as a volunteer, as a participant, as a sponsor or donor, and just as an attendee to come and have fun. Thank you very much. All right. Well, hello, everyone. My name is Kyle Ray. I have the great privilege of serving as the moderator this evening for what really is at the heart of our reception. And we're going to be talking to several panelists who lead organizations in our community that demonstrated great agility and ingenuity over the last 18 months, particularly with the onslaught of COVID as well as the unexpected freeze that happened uh, earlier this year. Um, before I introduce them, I do want to take a moment, uh, we just talked about it as a team, that in light of the events that happened in Afghanistan today, we know that we had soldiers who lost their lives, and we have had uh, both Afghans that lost their lives and were injured, as well as other military personnel who were injured. We thought it would be appropriate on this day to just take a moment of silence before we move on in our agenda. So I'm going to ask you, just to take a moment of silence as we reflect on the sacrifice um, that was made today uh, on behalf of so many. Thank you for that. I have the privilege this evening of introducing you to four individuals. Um, you may be aware of these individuals already. I'm learning more about them as I prepare to, to moderate this panel. Uh, you're going to be hearing from Brad Stewart, who serves as the Chief Operating Officer of the North Texas Food Bank. You're going to hear from Josh Florin, who is the President of Texas Health Resources here in Plano. You're going to hear from Sarah Bonser, who serves as the Superintendent of the Plano ISD. And then you're going to also hear from Mark Israelson, who serves as the city manager of Plano. Our format this evening is that we asked these presenters to prepare a three to four minute PowerPoint presentation, just highlighting some of the steps that were taken during the pandemic, as well as the freeze uh, from a leadership perspective. But the bulk of our time is going to be spent uh, in some conversation around some questions. We felt like as we were planning this event back in the spring, that if there was one thing we were really proud of in terms of leadership in our community here in Plano during these events over the last 18 months, it was really agility and ingenuity. And we felt like, man, if this were an awards uh, celebration, we would really be highlighting these individuals. We'd be giving them an award to say, well done. You did some things to respond in a rapidly changing environment that we are proud of uh, in this community. Just so you know who I am, uh, I lead Scent Church that is in Plano on Spring Creek near Coit. Um, I got more familiar 
with MCOR uh, over the last couple of years. We hosted a Christmas gathering uh, on our campus uh, for MCOR. But also earlier this year, if you want to talk about leadership agility, I remember I was, I was sitting in front of the fireplace at my house when we had lost power. And I got an email from someone in the community that said, hey, are you opening your church as a warming center? And I thought, well, no, probably not. We were being told that we didn't want to be an additional uh, drain on the power grid. I didn't even know if the church had power. And this person wrote me back and said, well, it's a little disconcerting to look over and see the sidewalks of the church lit up while we don't have power in our home. And I was like, man, we're not going out like that. We will not be known as the church that had well-lit sidewalks when nobody else had power. And so I ended up uh, getting acquainted with Mark Israelson and others in the city as we opened up the church as a warming center. It was not planned, but I love the way we we're able to serve. And that really, I think, is a picture of how leadership agility can look. You don't always know what's going to come at you. You just know you need to be agile and flexible. I think you're going to hear this evening from some leaders who have had to live that out uh, even real time now um, over the last 18 months. So um, I'm going to let uh, Brad Stewart go first. He has a short PowerPoint. They're gonna do their PowerPoints in succession. Uh, Mark does not have one. And then we're going to start some questions. As you've already seen in the chat, if you have Q&A that you want to ask, you can certainly use the Q&A feature. We already know we won't get to every question this evening but that shouldn't make you hesitant to ask the question and we'll get to as many as we can. So Brad, uh, take it away. All right, well, thank you very much. It's a privilege to be here and have the opportunity to talk a little bit about this. Uh, personally, I'm a product of Plano ISD in the city of Plano. So it's great to, uh, to be here in this capacity. So all together uh, at the food bank, we're, I'm so proud of what we've been able to accomplish uh, alongside our 200 member um, partner agency network that spans across all of North Texas, 13 counties. Um, you know, we were really able to respond in a meaningful way through the generous support of our community. If you go ahead and just show that next slide, it has some fast facts. Um, and it really does start with that community support. Uh, our community is incredibly generous. Uh, we saw uh, since the, the pandemic began, we saw $100 million uh, in gifts, much of which came through nearly 100,000 brand new first time donors to the food bank. And just to put that a little bit into context, um, that's about a four times increase in the amount of money um, and much more growth in the number of transactions because a lot of those first time donors were quite small. So it was a great problem to have, but to your point about uh, responding with agility, we had to figure out how to, how to manage that, that number of transactions. We certainly put that money to work really quickly, increasing our, our costs, frankly, by about three times. Um, Principally, that was through more purchased food. We were blessed with the financial resources, and we put them into buying food uh, because we knew that the, the demand was out there, and there were more and more people who were having uh, food insecurity as a challenge in their household. Uh, we learned on the fly about how to pursue um, and secure large-scale federal funds and how to shepherd those through uh, state-level administrators. That was a, a set of work that we had no experience in, to your point, uh, Kyle, around not having a clue how to do some things, but just stepping out and, and giving it a shot and learning along the way. Um, ultimately, once equipped with the resources, we move quickly to really scale uh, to that in increased need. You can see some of the impact numbers there on the slide. Um, ultimately, we effectively increased our food throughput. Sometimes it was you know 100% uh, pr from the prior year, same month. Uh, other times it was a little more moderate than that. Uh, but really, we scaled within the course of just a couple of weeks uh, to achieve that. So it was a pretty dramatic shift for us. Uh, so I really love today's theme around agility and ingenuity, because that's exactly uh, where we were and what it took. And it continues to be a learning endeavor for us. So uh, just in a nutshell, that's that's what we've been able to accomplish, again, through the support and the network uh, that we represent. And it's an honor to represent this work uh, of a lot of people. Wow. Thank you, Brad. I appreciate you sharing. I can't wait to probe some of that a little bit more. Um, next up, I'm going to turn it over to Josh and Josh, take it away. Can you see my slide deck? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. Well, I do appreciate you guys having me here. Um, as soon as I saw the, the topic for the panel was celebrating agility and ingenuity in the community. Um, obviously, I thought back to the last 18 plus months uh, and what this hospital has gone through uh, many times. 
if you were to look at the halls of the hospital, uh, you wouldn't even recognize it from what it was pre-COVID state. Um, I actually gave this presentation to uh, a Dallas uh, business professionals group on Tuesday and it went an hour and a half. And so uh, I've had to cut down this slide deck quite a bit, but I still have quite a bit. What I'd like to do too is go through this and, and use this as a great opportunity to show you pictures because it really is the best way to show um, what agility and ingenuity really looks like in a time of crisis. And with the pandemic hitting, um, we literally overnight had to completely rethink the way we are providing services to this community. Okay, so real quick, um, Texas Health Presbyterian Hospital uh, here in Plano, our main goal, our mission is to improve the health of the people in the communities we serve. So everything we do goes through that lens. When we provide services or we use resources, our first question is, how is this going to improve the health within this community? Um, and so we do that a variety of ways. Um, and then, you know, as soon as the uh, COVID pandemic hit, and then, of course, the freeze, we had to do things quite a bit differently. And I'm going to walk you through that tonight. When you talk about the impact to the community, what you see here is the hospital itself uh, is licensed for 338 main hospital beds. We have 48 uh, beds over at our C Behavioral Health Center. That's an inpatient psychiatric facility that is split between adolescent and adult. Uh, we have about 226 uh, patients in our acute care setting on a daily basis, um, but that has been running almost at over 300 um, with, the, with the COVID patients and the surges that we've seen. Um, you can see how many behavioral health uh, patients on average a day we have on the census. Um, you can see almost 17,000 or over 17,000 inpatient discharges, over 45,000 ER visits now, um, and a host of outpatient visits. So we touch a large number of people every day in this community. But when COVID hit, things changed dramatically. So what you see here is the trend line here at the hospital um, and what we saw. We saw a small jump when we thought things were actually really bad um, back in July of 20 um, and had no idea on what was about to hit January, December and January of 2021. And you can see at the largest spike that we had, we were at 108 patients that were COVID positive in house. So over a third of our patients in-house were COVID positive. Um, as you can imagine, that creates a situation where you immediately have to do things differently. And so we opened up a secondary uh, ICU over in our recovery room. Um, we shut down surgeries. We redeployed that staff, the CRNAs, the anesthesiologists all over to that area. Um, we had to open a third dedicated COVID unit and we even opened eight tents in the Tower C lobby. So when we were so inundated with patients that every bed in the hospital was full, um, the ER began to, back, began to back up with 20, 30, someday 40 patients just sitting down there for two, three days with no beds in the house to give. When that happens, then anybody walking in gets put in the waiting room. So the waiting room became unmanageable with so many patients seeking care. And what we realized was we weren't getting to patients that really needed us quickly enough. And so we went out and we found a local tent company that had uh, medical grade tents. And we found the biggest spot we could uh, put tents inside out of the elements. And we opened eight tents along the tower seat lobby, which I'll show you in a minute. We immediately opened those up and began to see 16 to 25 patients a day over in that area. Um, and of course you could imagine just opening those areas required a tremendous feat from our IT people having to run, we're all electronic on our medical records. So we had to get our rolling carts and the IT components uh, put in place. We had to get all the medications. Um, so really overnight, when I think by the time we had our tents up uh, in 48 hours, we saw our first patient. The state sent us over 30 nurses because at the time we had a large number that were going out. We closed our elective surgeries, outpatient procedures, and then we deployed all of those resources to a labor pool retrained, redeveloped competencies because people were going to be doing jobs that they had never done before. So here's just what it looked like in pictures. So we shut down all of our entrances with the exception of three. 
Those three entrances then had screeners. Here you can see OR nurses, L and D nurses, and physical therapists all redeployed to be screeners. We stopped valet because it wasn't safe to be in and out of individuals' cars. We immediately ran to Grapevine and we picked up three of these shuttles, these golf carts, and we turned our valet into a shuttle system where they were going out and put, taking people to and from the main doors. You can see plexiglass here. You see very few patients, only one uh, staff member in the right. Volunteers were, were uh, sent home. Plexiglass was put up everywhere in the facility. Um, and most of that was done uh, relatively quickly. I believe within 72 hours, we had plexiglass up. Um, our cafeteria, you can see all the tables in the back. We shut them down. Uh, we spaced everybody out and we did that throughout the hospital in all waiting areas. Furniture was removed, everything was spaced out. Here's a doctor delivering food trays um, because it wasn't safe to have uh, non-clinical um, personnel going into COVID positive rooms. So this is one of our uh, ICU intensivists. Um, he was delivering tray to all the COVID patients on the ICU that day. Here are the eight tents set up in our Tower C lobby. And you can see here, they were all set up with supplies inside, recliners, because these were low acuity, non-COVID patients. Uh, and we set up a secondary waiting room. And then um, you can see how those were set up. We were overwhelmed with what uh, the community did to, um, a, to respond and show us how much they cared for all of the hard work that was going on in the hospital. Here you can see a past, a local pastor's children who came to a prayer vigil that we had in front of the hospital um, and uh, the signs that they held up. All of our first responders paraded through the uh, campus. You can see here signs, all of the staff ran out to take pictures so they could post to social media. And then of course, vaccines hit. And for us, one of the first things we did was have a conversation with Mark Israelson about whether or not we had the ability to utilize space within the Plano community to provide vaccines. So we did it internally to our own staff and physicians. And then through the Sam Johnson Recreation Center, we began to set up one of the larger scale um, vaccination centers. And all in all, um, even with today's surge, you can see uh, we treated 757 inpatients, over 1,000 outpatients. It was broken between 43% male, 57% female, 70% um, Caucasian, 15% African American, and 9% Asian. And the very interesting thing, when the, when the big surge hit in January, in December and January, 50% were greater than 60 years of age. Um, with this most recent Delta surge, now 70% um, are under the age of 60. So this is exactly what you're seeing in the community. So immediately we had to pivot to how are we gonna treat pediatrics? If the children's hospitals are all full, we don't do pediatrics on the inpatient side, but we have now set up the ability to be able to take care of pediatrics on the fly if we have to because of the needs in this community and the fact that the children's hospitals are all completely full. Wow. So with that, it's just a little overview of what we've had to do over the course uh, you know, of the, the last 18 months. The Delta surge is still continuing on, anticipated over the next three to four weeks will continue to go up. Um, but this hospital will stand ready to meet the needs in any way it can. So with that, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you so much, Josh. And much like Brad's presentation, I can't wait to probe a little bit more. I really appreciate uh, the concise nature of your presentation and pictures always help as well. I want to next ask Sarah Bonser, who serves as the superintendent of Plano ISD, to share. I know you have a PowerPoint prepared, um, and then uh, we will turn it over to Mark after you. So go ahead, Sarah. Thank you. Thanks, Kyle. So uh, good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here this evening. Uh, it's, it's almost hard to remember when this all started. You know, we had the end of a school year, and everybody flipped to remote, and then really all of last year is probably more what I'll talk about once my PowerPoint comes up. Um, so I guess the, the first thing I would like to say is just kind of connecting back to the vision of Plano ISD. The, the commitment to excellence was really kind of a driving force of we know the quality of the educational system that Plano ISD is and our commitment to maintaining a level of excellence um, drove a lot of the work and the, the need to innovate and and switch how we were doing things or be agile in order to try to maintain excellence. Um, 
than to be dedicated to caring. And, and we found so many needs uh, as we've gone through the pandemic of, and the winter storm uh, that, that the ability to show how much we care as a school district about the community that we all live in um, was, was really inspirational and powerful. And then powered by learning, you know, never forgetting that um, we're a community of learners and learning together. And our focus is about the, the, our kids learning. Um, and, and I would say the grownups learned as much or more as the kids last year. Um, because of the change in everything, all the all the systems, we all had to learn new ways of doing thing and things. And we would say, if you asked uh, an educator prior to the pandemic, how long would it take to flip completely to virtual learning? They would have told you five to ten years, and we did it in probably two weeks. And so, you know, it's a little bit it's a, it's hard to really even kind of wrap your head around to that. And then Plano ISD proud, you know, like we're very proud to, to be a part of this community and to serve, but we're not about being prideful. It's about that would our actions, would the things that we're doing make our students proud, make our families proud, and make our community proud, uh, and, and our moms and dads, right? And so um, I just want to say that, you know, when we started to think about the agility in the pandemic, we have every system. We run food service for 50,000 people. We run transportation for 50,000 students. We, um, we run um, health and safety uh, systems. We run, of course, the educational system. We have facilities, we have landscape. And I say facilities, we have over 90 buildings that we maintain every day. So every single system of the school district had to change. And so um, really we, we, we wrapped our arms around the fact that we had to have return to school protocols, but then we also had to have administrative response protocols because when you get out to the campus level, they have to administer all the things. And so how would they do that? So we had multiple systems developed. One would be what the public needs to see. One is what the, the employees need to see and then all the communication that goes around that. So that's system thinking. Um, but just to give you a landscape of who, who we're dealing with, we have uh, 50,000 students, roughly 7,000 employees, 73 schools, 90 rooftops, 125 countries represented in our district and over 90 languages spoken. Um, and 8,000 uh, plus of those students speak Spanish as their primary home language. And then you can see English language learners make up 16% of our student body, gifted and talented 19%. 12% special education, which is another uh, diversity when you start to flip to remote that you have to make sure you're, you're uh, meeting needs. And then 34% of our students are economically disadvantaged. So and that was pre-pandemic, you know? And so that number has actually grown a little bit. And then we have very involved parents in our community. We have over 23,000 PTA members. So we know that we're surrounded by families who care about their schools and want to be involved. So some of our COVID response pieces, and I'm, I'm gonna go through this relatively quickly, um, but you know, really the first thing in our primary business is the pivot to virtual learning. And so last year um, we had two learning environments and one was face-to-face -face and one was switching to remote. And that happened through what we called school at home. So parents could reselect their learning environment every nine weeks. So we were moving kids back and forth within classrooms in person or remote and moving staff um, all year long. Uh, it was fairly disruptive, but we managed. Uh, we ended up roughly 55% in person on average and 45% stayed in school at home last year. And so our goal was that, I always say it was like, um, you know, they say it's like building an airplane while you're trying to land it. And my analogy is no, we were building two airplanes. They had to fly at the same time all at the same time, you were building one, changing the other one. You were both trying to get to the same place and land safely, everyone. And so that's really what we were trying to do last year. And so that was our primary business was delivering an excellent education through two models of instruction. Um, then you get to uh, meals served. Um, we had a lot of effort around nutrition during from night. 2019 to today, we have served um, over 4 
million four hundred thousand meals to our families and we're continuing this year to serve free meals breakfast and lunch to all students in Plano ISD whether they qualify for free and reduced lunch or not um, we had weekly food drops uh, with Minnie's food pantry and currently Minnie's is still serving us on Wednesdays and Saturdays and um, we partnered with the North Texas Food Bank and food for kids at 37 of our elementary campuses and that's ongoing they also provide bi-weekly food drops and emergency food, food drops. And they did 17 summer food drops in coordination with the school district. And they have a food pantry at Armstrong Middle School. And then Brighter Bites partners with us and we have food drops at Christie Elementary, uh, food pantry at Meadows and Memorial. And then we have the Travis Frederick food pantry at Huffman Elementary. So we are big in the food business to make sure that our kids um, can come to school fed and stay stay well uh, nu nu uh, with nutrition all day long uh, so that they come ready to learn. Uh, our wraparound services also exploded um, during the school year, and that was always a part of the growth of, of what we wanted to see in our strategic plan. But again, like the pandemic, that accelerated the wraparound services that the school district provided, and that um, included helping families find shelter, we help families pay their bills through um, the Richards Douglas uh, Fund. We provided transportation services, homeless services, medical, dental, and vision support. Uh, we have an employee assistance program for our families uh, of employees that found themselves in time of financial exigent, exigence who needed uh, just a little bit of extra help, and that's funded through our Education Foundation. Um, we, we had expanded our telehealth and tele behavioral health program with Children's Hospital uh, so that we were delivering those services remotely for students in Plano ISD. And we have a family counseling uh, program through SMU that we flipped to remote so that our families that were receiving counseling services um, were able to do that. We also have a Plano Up grant through uh, tech, uh, Texas uh, Health Presbyterian. And that is for food insecurity and mental health in the 75074 zip code. And through that, we were able to provide food and mental health support services in that particular zip code. And that is still ongoing. Um, we partnered with the city on being a vaccination site for um, citywide vaccinations. And so Clark Stadium served for several months as the Collin County, one of the Collin County sites. And then we also, became an approved provider of vaccines so that we could vaccinate our own employees. Uh, and we also then had extra in vaccines. And so we invited surrounding districts to immunize uh, their, vaccinate their teachers uh, so that we were sharing our resources with anyone that we could since we had them. Um, and we continue to do that today. Um, we distributed 27,632 Chromebooks last year. So every student that needed a device, we set up drive-by. We, we disabled our, our carts and we re-imaged all those Chromebooks over spring break when we found out we were not coming back. And we deployed those like in a drive-through um, within four days, I think we were deploying. And then we, we got 100, uh, 1,800 hotspots to the families who said they did not have wireless. And, and so we, we did that. Um, we started a new website and daily communication for principals, families, and staff. And then our Education Foundation and PTA were just instrumental in providing resources. And our Education Foundation actually um, gave about $250,000 of support that they were able to go out and find grants that would support all of the PPE technology and supplies that, that we were needing to, to serve families at home and then serve families at school. So those, that's a quick shot. Uh, there's, there's a lot. Um, <laughs> well, but I have one more slide. Okay. So what did we learn? Um, we have automated very quickly enrollment. Um, this year we've, we've also given out devices and the hotspots need has increased. So we've met that need virtual parent meetings, cashless, cashless payment, um, and, and maybe we've learned technology is a tool, but it is not the teacher, right? We knew that, but we know that even more. And from the winter storm, we had 51 campuses affected. Um, 
I would say we, we learned a lot about having to work with all of our municipalities through the winter storm because we had to drain water lines to try to avoid burst pipes. And so the city was so instrumental in supporting us. And then our facility staff worked literally 24 hours a day. We had 225,000 square feet of water damage, 21 building, buildings flooded uh, through their fire suppression system breaks, 23 buildings had HVAC damage, 23 buildings had domestic leaks and 165 of those were leak repairs that we had to do. So 51 buildings were impacted, but we opened school on the first day that we were able to, that everything opened back up in 68 of our 73 campuses and the other five went remote. And so we were back up and running almost 100% within a couple of days. Um, so it was, a, it was a big community effort, big district effort. So that's my snapshot. Well, Sarah, I really appreciate the level of detail that you shared. I think it's, it can be hard to talk about your own accomplishments sometimes, but people need to hear uh, just all the work that went into educating so many students in our community. As the parent of a, of a third grader um, who was impacted by all of that at a PISD school, I'm grateful for the communication and for all of that agility that you described. Um, before I say anything else, then I want to turn it over to Mark Israelson. Mark, I know that you are sharing without a PowerPoint. Um, I want to encourage you that uh, there will be ample time for me to ask you some questions so you don't have to tell us everything that the city did, but give us a snapshot or a high level of view of uh, some of the things that the city was able to do during the pandemic, as well as the freeze earlier this year. Oh, wait, Mark, you are unmuted, but for some reason we are not hearing you yet. And I know we, I think we heard you earlier. Are you still seated next to the mirror? Oh, wait, was that you? No, that was me. I was, um, yeah, we can't, can't hear Mark. Right. Yeah, we still can't hear you, Mark. Um, so I'm not sure what to do about Mark. If there's someone there on site that can. This? Oh yeah. Yeah. Wait, we can hear you there now. We go. All right. There we go. There we go. It's always user. It's always user fault. So <laughs> you know, in the Zoom environment that we've all adapted to. Evidently, my adaptation is a little slower than the rest of the class. So that's okay. Start with that. um, but first, good to see you, Kyle. And uh, I, I want to start by saying that uh, I'm extremely fortunate to have community partners like the North Texas Food Bank, PISD, um, Texas Health Resources, and, and Scent Church. The city, we have gone through um, 18 months that can only be described as challenging. And at each and every turn, um, the city has had to respond. Uh, and so I tried to put that into a, a slideshow. And as I was doing that, I kept, I kept deciding that I did not do justice to what my team went through and what the scenario was. Because if you, if you actually put it down in, in words, you start looking at it and say, this can't be real. Uh, you wouldn't imagine this or wish this on anybody. So I'll start by saying in, in March of 2020, when everything hit, the city decided quickly when we're talking about adaptability to close our libraries, close our recreation centers, to start minimizing um, the, the communal effects of some of our facilities. And we immediately began pivoting some of, some of our employees. But city services, especially public safety, trash, water, sewer, um, our financial services, our IT department, all those support services never stopped. Throughout the pandemic, throughout the winter storm, one of the things you're going to hear from the city is each and every day we show up and try to make sure we stay the city of excellence each and every day. And we work closely with our partners to make sure our citizens are taken care of each and every day. So we pivoted to the, the Zoom environment, much like we're sharing right now with, uh, with everybody online, and started moving some of our boards and commission meetings, some of our council meetings and everything else to a, a virtual environment, distancing and learning. And what we realized was that in, in a pandemic, you're dealing with different forms of scarcity the entire time. So we started off working through things like PPE and working with Sarah and working with Josh and working with others to talk about who has supplies, who can spare what, and how we can work together to make sure that Plano is taken care of. And one of the first calls Sarah and I had was about what she could spare uh, with her supplies. And to have a partner like that, uh, that cares uh, about our staff and our community, 
uh, it goes a long way to why Plano is, is regarded as, as a well-run city and a, and a strong community. And so we began working through how we were going to learn about uh, this, this situation we're in. And it was emergency orders, everything from the, the governor's order to the county order. And we actually have two counties. So we have Denton County, we have Collin County, and then the city's order on top of that and how that we were communicating with our, our citizens. Because at the end of the day, the citizens and the businesses have to understand how to operate and what the rules are what will keep them safe. And that was always our priority throughout this was keeping our staff and our community safe. So we learned early on that communications was gonna be a great key and our communication staff has done an amazing job of putting together websites, call trees, even call centers uh, that we took from staff that were in our libraries. And since our libraries weren't open, we put them together in a call center so that we could answer questions and actually call out to make sure we're providing timely information to our citizens and businesses throughout the, um, the pandemic. So we began working through that uh, and realized uh, as we were uh, learning about COVID that adaptability was going to be the key. And one of the, one of the areas that we're really proud of was our park monitor program. Uh, Josh is in healthcare and I, I can tell you that getting outside and having fresh air, getting to exercise and getting to have a mental health break from the unknown was a key aspect to uh, Plano. And we have one of the, we have actually the highest rated park system in the entire state of Texas. Um, and we're really proud of that. But making sure that citizens could get out during an unknown situation and experience our parks and trail system to have our staff out there saying, hey, this is how we need to distance. This is how we need to, to operate in order to keep everybody safe was one of the things we were really proud of because it gave everybody that respite from having to stay indoors and have that unknown. So we worked through COVID and the more we worked uh, together with, with some of our community partners, the more we learned about social distancing. Um, and we eventually got to the point of being able to start reopening some of our businesses. Uh, but the economic impact that we went through and how we were supporting um, people that were out of work, how businesses that were closed, we worked closely with the county, we worked, worked closely with Frisco and McKinney and Allen um, to provide some of those federal funds back in the way of grants to, um, to our small businesses and to some of our homeowners to make sure they were taken care of. Uh, again, great community partners and, and we're very fortunate to have it. And then as things start, uh, start looking up a little bit as vaccine is developed and as we start talking about how that's gonna roll out, uh, we just get started on some great programs working with Sarah at the, the drive through vaccination site at Park Stadium and Josh at our senior recreation center. Um, we had winter storm Uri, and the only thing I can describe that is is a confluence of, of five incidents that each unto themselves would be a, a disaster that is historic. So we started off with a weather uh, emergency that turned into a power emergency that turned into a water emergency that turned into a property emergency that turned into a financial emergency in five days. And each day as we, as we pivoted to go do that, our focus had to be on the safety of our employees and on our community and responding to each and every challenge. And as I said, our employees showed up each and every day. We set records that week uh, for fire calls and police calls. Over 5,000 calls were responded to for emergencies. And that's, that's for our citizens. And so, those are employees that uh, also have families at home that may be without power. And so I have the utmost respect for all of our staff that showed up each and every day to make sure that our community was taken care of and that our, our citizens were uh, safe in that. And then after Winter Storm Uri and we started recovering, it really became full bore towards vaccinations and trying to restore businesses to, to full operations. And so we've adapted a, a number of different ways. Um, but the biggest thing that, that I would share is our, our focus from the beginning has been safety, safety for our team, safety for our citizens. And we could not have done it without our partners. Um, we appreciate them. We all have the same goal, keep Plano fantastic, keep Plano the city of excellence, and we appreciate them. So with that, I, I tried to find a way to put that on three or four slides to cover three or four minutes. Uh, and I failed miserably, so I, I decided that uh, covering it verbally would probably be better. Um, but Kyle, we appreciate what you brought to the table in, in the warming shelter that you had, uh, Grace Church, the um, Collin County Chinese Fellowship. Uh, the, we had several folks that, that opened up warming stations, and, and that just shows the value of our community and how much they care for one another. So with that, uh, I'll just say thank you to each of you of one of, of our partners and I'll be happy to answer any questions. 
Thank you, Mark. And I think you did a great job um, sharing that in a concise way. So I would say, Mark, Brad, Sarah, and Josh, you can feel free to unmute yourselves. We're going to have a bit of a conversation. The first question that I have for you is really more of a personal leadership question. And here's the context for it. You know, before I was a pastor, I've been a pastor for 15 years now and only two years here in Plano. I moved from Michigan in 2019. But before I was a pastor, I was actually a mechanical engineer in the automotive industry, did product development work and, you know, did a lot of problem solving. And one thing I learned as I moved from engineering into pastoral ministry is that there are some leadership lessons that are just transferable. It doesn't matter if you're leading a nonprofit, if you're leading in a business setting, if you're leading in the life of a, a faith um, community, there's some lessons that are transferable. It's fair to say that what we have gone through in the last 18 months, there's no class in your college journey that could have prepared you for leading in the midst of a pandemic or a historic freeze. So the first question is really uh, for, for each of you to answer, what would you say is the greatest personal leadership lesson that you've learned leading in this environment over the last 18 months? You know, I, I took a quote that John Maxwell has shared. It says, we cannot become what we need by remaining what we are. Change is inevitable. Growth is optional. So this first question is really getting at, help the audience kind of understand what agility and ingenuity in this changing environment has taught you personally as a leader in your leadership journey. Whoever wants to go first can. Sure, I'll, I'll be more than happy to jump off and, and then turn it over to Sarah and Brad. Um, you can imagine at the hospital, whenever the pandemic started, um, the sheer fear um, from staff realizing that other industries and other folks, they could easily pivot to work from home. They were going to be called to come in every day and take care of these patients. And so little at the time was known about transmissibility, the appropriate procedures to take care of these patients. Um, and so we went through a series of life cycles. I couldn't say enough how important communication is when your entire workforce is terrified of what's going to come next, terrified of the disease, terrified of being overrun and not having available resources, terrified of them being the only person that is able to care for these patients and not being able to go home, not being able to take some time off to regroup. They saw early on that this was gonna rest solely on, the, on their shoulders um, and they were gonna to have to weather that storm and they were terrified in the beginning. Um, as that went through and they began to realize that the procedures kept them safe, people were not getting sick um, and the state was stepping up with additional staffing resources to help them. Even though it was hard work, um, they began to get comfortable and then they began to get very proud of what they were doing. Um, then they saw folks coming to the campus, prayer vigils on campus, first responders driving through, and then they realized how important and how supported they were throughout the community. Um, one of the things I started early on was a sometimes multiple times a day, but at least several times a week because information was changing so rapidly. I know Sarah understands that. I mean, Sarah, the mask mandate, the number of times you're bouncing back and forth on trying to determine if you're mandated or not. And I, I, I totally sympathize, empathize with you um, because that's what we were doing early on. The procedures were changing, the guidelines were changing. It's airborne, no, it's droplet. Here's what we're gonna do. And our staff, I felt so sorry because they were just in the middle of multiple changes every day. So I started a COVID update and that email built on itself over time with all the previous updates underneath it. And they knew to look every single day that I would send out that COVID update and it would be key information that's going on on this campus. Um, and so I just kept that in front of them. The first thing is communication. The second thing is being present. So I knew I couldn't work from home, even though I could have easily done my job from my home office. But I knew that if I was gonna ask my staff to be here on the front lines and take care of these patients and put themselves at risk, that I had to be there. And so I rounded on the COVID units. I went up there and talked to both patients and uh, sat down with staff who were either in tears or didn't understand or 
So I knew my whole administrative team had to be here and had to be up on the floors with them, showing them that we're here, we're linked arm in arm, and we're going to get through this together. I, uh, I love it. I think one of the things I've said to people is that it's strange to me how often I have to relearn the communication lesson as a leader. Because <laughs> so often, if you just communicate, even if people don't necessarily agree with or like your decision, uh, it just reduces a whole lot of questions if they can just you know, understand, if, they, if they're just communicated with. So uh, Sarah, Brad, Mark, others, what, what would you say is your greatest personal leadership lesson over the last 18 months? So I'll follow along on what Josh, Josh's message was. Communication is, is critical, but I think having simplicity and clarity of message is really important. Um, setting, that, setting that expectation um, for your staff is, is really, really important. And, you know, there's, there's a time when you're in um, a crisis like winter storms or during the pandemic where you have to be honest with your staff about what you know and what you don't know and what's the best information available. And uh, in our roles, we're there to make decisions. And I think having that humility of saying, there's times that we don't know all the information that we wish we knew, but we have to make decisions to keep things moving forward. And then as you make those decisions, um, you let go and trust your staff. And I think setting that expectation and that, that vision, I heard Josh mention it about people in service and being there on the front lines, I 100% agree. If you're not standing there shoulder to shoulder with them um, when times are, are tough, uh, they, they know that your level of commitment is a little bit different than what you're asking them to do. And I think it's really important that you are there shoulder to shoulder. But as you set that expectation and as you communicate, it's okay to be human. It's okay to be honest and say, this is the best information we have. We're gonna make a decision. And if better information comes out, we're gonna pivot and we're gonna move in that direction. And that's what we've done um, time in, time out throughout uh, this pandemic, throughout the winter storm. I've seen all of our partners do the same thing and it's, it's okay to, to be human that way. Um, but I think that simplicity and that clarity in messaging and in communications is just so important for staff to be able to feel like they understand what the direction is and what their job is. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I'll, tie, I'll tie in. I mean, I we learn really fast and it, you know, it's real humbling, right? When you, you try hard and all of a sudden it's like, you're overwhelming us and we think we're doing a good job because we're pushing out information, but it's overwhelming. The parents were saying, I'm getting emails from, you know, all these different people and the teachers were getting emails and so we, my team, we usually meet like the executive team once a week. We met twice a day, every day. We started the day for two hours together. We ended the day for two hours together. And the end of the day was one document every day with every communication from every department in one place. And then it was, there was the principal version, the staff version, and the parent version. And we're still doing that today. Wow. And that, that happens every day. Now we don't, the amount of time every day is less. So that's the first thing is streamlining communication, just like everyone has said. The second, second thing for me is, is the team. You know, the, I have a, there's an African proverb I have always in my office. that says, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. COVID is a marathon and we have to go far. So we have to go together. Mm -hmm. And so I would say the my team, you know, the team at the district, the teacher team, the principal team, but then the community team, everyone coming together. I have made a lot of new friends, people who have no idea who I am, who when you pick up the phone and call and say, I need some help. And they were like, what can I do? Mm -hmm. Like the power of that is number one, to share the burden sometimes is just so it feels pretty good to have somebody stand shoulder to shoulder with you. And there were so many great partners uh, ready to help. And then flexibility. I think you have to, like we went back in the, probably the end of the first semester and we did listening rounds with elementary teachers, middle school teachers and high school teachers. And we said, what can we do to make your life better? Because they're the ones running two learning environments, right? So the support they have is what will make the biggest difference in the classroom. And so we did listening rounds with those groups of teachers. And then, and then the team went back and said, what, what, have, what are they telling us that we can go back and 
do something different to help them. And I'll tell you, one of the things was um, they they needed an, another monitor because they were trying to run like a little Chromebook screen and a big screen on their desktop. And we had our bond technology dollars. We had that in the plan, but just for a later deployment. So we just flipped our plan around for how to use our resources. And by February, every teacher in the district, every employee had two monitors to run. And it sounds like, you know, it's, it was no big deal for to get that to happen. It was just the importance of listening and then doing what you could to help people find a way through this a little bit easier. Wow. Because it's been hard. Wow. So that's great. Brad, how about how about you? Yeah, I want to add just a little bit. I really resonate with what was already said, but I think uh, for me, it was really a, a learning around faith, uh, whether that's faith in your uh, chosen religion or faith in your community and just the goodness of people. Um, you know, things are highly ambiguous and no, having enough confidence in who you are and what your mission is. And it's important to just step out and into that ambiguity, knowing that you're not going to get it completely right, but and that you won't have everything you need. Ask for it and the community will come through. It's amazing how that happens. Uh, somebody made the comment earlier that we never would have imagined, I think, Sarah, it was you, never would have imagined the amount of progress we would have seen in moving to virtual classrooms. Same holds true for, like, for us, for our fundraising. Um, we lived in a world where there was a real scarcity mentality in the nonprofit world around there's a fixed amount of resources out there to be garnered. Well, COVID blew the roof off of that um, simply by asking. So I think it, it's faith to, in knowing who you are, what your mission is, and stepping into the ambiguity of that, which is really where leadership, I think, happens. And, and knowing that even if you don't get it right, you're going to get a, a, an equal share of grace to take the next step in a learning direction uh, that you would have had that learning if you had not taken the first step to begin with. So move quickly, move with confidence, and, and adjust as you go. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I think you, you find yourself in some of these situations where you say, man, I never have a reason to doubt the community ever again. That's it. They came through this time. I, I, I'm going to actually take a question that has come in uh, via the chat. And I would say to, to set the stage for this question, I have no idea what the diversity of your teams look like. And this question is relevant because this is an MCOR, um, the Multicultural Outreach Roundtable presentation. So the question is uh, from Nigel Eastman. Do you think so he first sets up, he, he happens to work at Scent Church. So um, he says Scent Church is intentionally multi-ethnic. There's some things we do intentionally to try and reach the variety of people in our surrounding community. His question is, do you think intentional multi-ethnic leadership plays a greater role in serving the resource-limited individuals of Collin County? And what roles would you like to see multi-ethnic church communities serve in? So that may be a question that you know everyone wants to speak into, or just a couple of you, but it's really getting around what's been the benefit uh, as you've tried to meet these variety of needs of having diverse leadership, if you have that, and uh, if not, uh, what role do you want the multi-ethnic church-based community to play in helping your organization fulfill its vision? So I guess I can start on on that side of things, and you know, as an organization, um, we work towards reflecting uh, our community. And, and that's in our leadership, that's in our staff members. It's, it's working towards that reflection because it's, it's important when you're serving um, a community to, to make sure that you understand those values, you understand um, the needs, you understand the connections. And that's really important uh, as, as a city government. For, uh, for a faith-based community um, organization, for us, in, in having it be multi-ethnic, we think that's fantastic because for us, it's a very welcoming environment. And that's what we view the city as. That's what we view our community as, as a welcoming, um, a welcoming community. And so we want to be able to find a place for each and every uh, citizen to be involved, to feel like this is their home, to feel like this is their, their town and have that sense of ownership. And for us, you know, being involved whether it's neighborhood cleanups, whether it is assisting with food insecurity, whether it is uh, assisting with some of our, our senior community that may need uh, some time and relationships. Uh, having a, a, a denomination that, that's multi-ethnic 
means that you're able to, to cross a, a number of areas that you might be able to find a connection with one of our citizens and make an impact. And uh, for us, it's connections one citizen at a time. And so having a, a broader group to, to work from that somebody can identify with, that they can relate to and they can connect with, to us, that has a lot of value uh, in our community. And we hope you all will stay involved and help uh, assisting our, our citizens much like you did during the winter storm. Awesome. Others, anybody else want to weigh in on that question? How important? I'll, I'll jump in. All right, go ahead, Josh. Yeah, so as you can imagine, um, we do spend quite a bit of time discussing ethnicity, uh, you know, specifically getting into um, racial beliefs, uh, religious beliefs at the hospital, because nothing challenges you more than winding up with a major health event. Um, and then you start leaning on everything in your culture, in your religion, just to try to cope. Um, so we spend quite a bit of time talking about that. Um, medicine is not cookie cutter. So there are some parts of it that can be, um, but when it truly comes down to empathizing with your patient and trying to find both mind, body, and spirit, how to care for them, you really have to be open-minded. So um, that, that even includes uh, recognizing things that could encroach in like unconscious bias. You have to be very aware of how you're treating these families and these patients. And so now you can imagine that's difficult in and of itself in a hospital. So now you lock your hospital down and you have individuals who used to have people speaking for them and on their behalf. And now you've removed all that. Um, so we put iPads in place up on rolling stands and we took it all around the hospital if they didn't have phones to communicate. But you can imagine that is a, yet another source of potential uh, problem for us is people are speaking different languages. Any given day, uh, over a hundred languages are spoken in this hospital. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have language lines and we have video interpreters, um, but still nothing is really as good as their support system. Um, and so then you introduce COVID vaccines, things that are highly polarizing to this whole dynamic. And so what we learned real quick is we were gonna have to really brush up and be aware of what um, these individuals needed to help with their support system. Mm -hmm. um, we spent a lot of time with our chaplains, spending time talking and researching. And we did a lot of research um, because COVID introduced things that we weren't or uh, may not have been uh, familiar with in certain religious uh, and um, other cultures. And so it really has opened up our eyes and led us down a path of becoming even more aware and involved. Um, and then in terms of, you know, the, the local clergy and how we interact with them, for a, a, in a large part, we locked a lot of them out um, and tried to keep the, the amount of uh, traffic down. And you, you close out somebody's religious leader and you've only exacerbated what is already a big problem. And so what we realized was we really needed to go the other way. We need to find safer ways to bring family back to the patient, bring their religious leaders back to the patient. So we started changing our visitation policy and really understanding that, that that's an important dynamic to heal. So that's going to be something that we take away from this and we continue to work on going forward. Awesome. Sarah, Brad, any, any thoughts you would add to that or should I move on to the next question? Well, I, you know, I'll, from the standpoint of, of the school district, you know, we have, we have so many diverse students and families in our district that we serve and, and really, you know, every, every level within the organization, it's very important to have diversity so that students see teachers, principals, you know, all kinds of folks that they, that they interact with during the day um, that, that they feel comfortable with, that they, that, that they um, see that the staff is as diverse as a student body. So that's been a goal in Plano ISD for a very long time and continues to be a priority um, within our strategic plan um, because we know how important that is. And just, you know, from the standpoint of COVID, um, a couple of the things that we had to do differently was for our bilingual students is, you know, when the bilingual students um, needed extra support virtually, 
um, providing remote learning in another language uh, was was a different experience for us. And and then making sure that all of our communications going to families, uh, that all of our families could understand what was coming home to them. And so, um, you know, we we hired bilingual uh, translators full time that are now still on staff with us, so that everything that we do, we can try to reach all of the diverse. Um, community that we have both in our schools and at home. So big priority. Yeah, I love the intentionality of what you just described. I think whenever I get asked by other pastors, like, what are some of the things you do to be, be a multi-ethnic congregation? I end up using the word intentional about a thousand times because that really is the key bias to, to have an intentional mindset um, to do things like hiring um, translators, as you just described. Um, Brad, I'm going to move on actually to another question that has come in. Um, this one came in through the Q&A box. So it's uh, from someone anonymous it just says, what are some ways we as a community can support our neighbors and coworkers that are in need? During the pandemic, there were shortages in basic needs. Is there a list of resources or best ways to get a hold of organizations that are committed to help? So I, I know that that's a general question. I guess maybe to make it specific to your to you all as panelists, as we progressed through the pandemic and even through the freeze, did you find yourself compiling like some general resource lists? Are those still available? Talk us through any of that uh, in a concise way. Sarah, I saw you nodding your head. Yeah, we, we um, really have upped our family and community services through this. And so we, on our website, we have actually, a. if you wanna go out to our site, you can say, I need help with, and it'll actually point you to the direction of resources. We also opened um, a welcome center over on 18th Street. The Bird Center is now a, a welcome center and wraparound service center. So there's food pantry, clothes closet, homeless services, it will have a, a functioning clinic. It has uh, any new family coming will come there, uh, enroll in our district, and then we do a family find, what do you need? And so that we can connect to resources. And so we have a lot of new partners. Uh, we're still looking for partners. And so uh, if you're interested in, in connecting to the student and family support, community support for the school district anyway, um, you can reach out to uh, to myself or Dr. Courtney Gober, uh, that's in his division, and I can put that in the chat. Uh, but if you'll reach out to them, we are always looking for partners who want to help come alongside. Awesome. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in on this one. So I mentioned before the food bank's not the food bank, but for the partner organizations who do that last mile distribution of the food, who really provide that case level um, in, in, uh, engagement with folks, to understand what's behind their food insecurity and to connect them to resources. So actually we, we feel that we serve as a meaningful convener of a lot of different services. Um, so we're happy to, to play that role. I think we, if you go onto our website, you can do a search for food pantries and you can see a, a long list of different organizations. Uh, they each have a unique twist on how they go about serving uh, a range of things, food insecurity being one of them. Uh, that's what brings them to that website. Um, to begin with. So that's one spot. Another that I've picked up on actually in, in uh, the last year is really what shows up on North Texas Giving Day. Uh, it's kind of a proverbial who's who uh, in the philanthropic community. And so you can find a range of organizations that many of whom are very small uh, and are geographically bound that can be really helpful. So that can be a good uh, Rolodex if Rolodexes are still a thing. <laughs> good. Hey, I want to ask a, a very specific question. I'm hoping, I, I know that there are probably comprehensive answers for each of your organizations, but I'm wanting you to think bullet points because, um, you know, there's some more questions we want to get to. The question really starts with for the city, but each organization I think has been impacted by this. And Sarah, you've already spoken to it. Mark, can you speak to how the city has addressed the issue of homelessness, which it seems like likely increased over the past 18 months? if not in Plano specifically in the broader county. And then I'm assuming every other organization uh, represented here has been impacted um, by homelessness. So Mark, I know we prepped you that this would be one of the questions we might ask. Um, just give us in bullet point form, how's the city been responding to homelessness over the last 18 months? 
So the city city has been uh, dedicating more resources. We've actually added a couple of staff members to to address homelessness, and it's a matter of uh, pairing um, people in need with resources that are available. So whether it was through the economic uh, downturn that we saw and some of the federal funds for rapid rehousing, whether it was working with um, somebody that was in need and uh, needed a, a nonprofit such as Hope Store, we work with all of our uh, partner agencies and with funding sources to make sure that we are providing resources to someone that is not only homeless, but somebody that might be at risk or on being close to being homeless. So it's there's a, a continuum that we work through um, and we work with PISD, we work with um, some of our neighboring counties, some of our neighboring cities to work through those resources to be able to identify and provide assistance to people. And for us, that's, that's an extremely um, important aspect. It's not just helping provide resources from, um, for people that need them that are homeless, but it's helping prevent homelessness and helping address that uh, in that step before that, which is critically important to us. So we do have uh, resources there. We have uh, several staff members that are very involved. Uh, we actually have uh, social workers on staff to help assist. Um, and so we are working through that um, to try to make sure that we have as comprehensive uh, an approach as we possibly can. But we're working with partner agencies, partnering counties, um, partnering cities to make sure that we are um, trying to match um, needs with resources. Awesome. Any other lessons from anyone else or, or direct impact when it comes to the homeless population, things that you've learned or done differently over the course of the last 18 months? Yeah, I'll just bring up, um, I think there's also a question floating out there uh, about uh, treating folks with disabilities. Uh, have we seen some of those increase? You know, yeah. just like Mark said, we've got, you know, social workers and, and partner agencies uh, we've got a great working relationship, to be honest, with the um, with the city fire department and, you know, being able to provide a paramedicine program to be able to go into people's homes that might have uh, disabilities or be able to refer to shelters and things. So uh, that community paramedicine program follows up with patients in their homes um, to really evaluate their needs, even going so far as to making sure that they've got uh, food in their pantry, follow-up appointments, medications are, are being used appropriately. Um, but then, you know, from disabilities to homeless, we, we definitely saw an increase of patients with varying kinds of needs. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where our partner agencies and the social workers and caseworkers that we have are, are vitally important. Um, wow. Because as you can imagine, we can't, especially right now, can't have somebody stuck in the hospital for too long um, because there's so many people that need care. So we have to be efficient. Wow, all right, thank you. Um, Sarah, one question that we, again, we, we kind of prepped your team for this. It's a question around equity gaps. One thing that got covered a lot in the national media and also locally when we made the switch so quickly to virtual learning had to do with this equity gap among students. You've already spoken to hotspots and wireless access. Any other lessons or revelations, I would say, that have come to light over the last 18 months as it relates to the equity gap among students in Plano ISD? Sure, and I guess one of them, probably one of the biggest things we saw, and, and Mark kind of alluded to this, was the the pandemic crisis creating financial crisis, which is kind of around the, what we're talking about. And so we saw a lot of our kids last year go to work. Mm -hmm. So one of the equity gaps was that some kids were participating in school during the day and then work, didn't need to work. Other kids were working shifts to help their families to be able to stay in their homes and, and you know have, have resources. And kids were kids were accessing their education sometimes is you know 11 o'clock at night one o'clock in the morning did we saw kids like round the clock doing school and so one of the things was was like trying to find all of our kids so some kids just went missing and that's a huge equity gap i mean you think about kids that disappear uh without their education that's a like like that's part of our job and so we went on roundups, literally, we, 
we got in vans and we we went to homes and we took social workers with us and we like we tried to find kids and we created a new um a new system for attendance because we typically would file truancy with the collin county courts maybe two three hundred a year last year we we created the plano isd attendance review board and instead of filing truancy we brought families in and we said what, what what here's your student they're not at school what can we do to help you and we filed 16 cases last year and everybody else just got help and those oh. kids came back to school and so for us you know some of it was they they needed resources the families did that they didn't have in order for that student to come back to school and so um you know that's how equity gaps get closed is when we can continue to educate the kids and and so i'm i was really proud of that that's that's one example um some of the things that we've had to do to to we'll be closing achievement gaps for a while and mm -hmm. those are all equity gaps you know I, you know one way or the other every student has been impacted by what has happened in the last year and a half I want to, if we end up with time later, I want to come back and have you speak more specifically to how you're going to try and close those achievement gaps. We are um, down to about our last 11 minutes. So uh, there's one more big question and, um, and then we'll get into some quick hitters. I'm assuming, I could be wrong in this assumption, but at some level, I'm assuming that each of your organizations um, benefited from some form of, you know, federal financial assistance. Um, I guess what I'm wanting to hear from a leadership perspective is just walk us through the anatomy of the decision making, like how, how, how many people are involved in the decision making or how are decisions made about whether or not to receive those funds and how those funds get get utilized in your organization and and Brad I'll start with you. Yeah, you bet. One of the biggest challenges we faced typically the food bank um, relies upon about 40,000 volunteers a year. And in the face of COVID, the volunteers just disappeared, right? Everyone was scared and locked down, et cetera. And so uh, we found ourselves in a situation where we had a, a higher need for labor, but a lower supply. Uh, and so the decision-making process was done at a leadership level. It was pretty easy to make. Uh, we looked at the demand going up, the unemployment claims going up. You could see uh, food insecurity rising day by day and week by week. Uh, so the decision-making was pretty easy. Um, the mechanism on how to go after that was a little bit challenging, um, but we, we sorted that out. Uh, we, we went after both funds as well as uh, labor. So the labor we actually got through the National Guard had never done that before. Uh, so uh, put in a request and, and like a lot of these requests, you know, it, it goes radio silent for a while and you reformat it six ways. Uh, and then all of a sudden one random Thursday evening at seven, you get a call that says, hey, 270 National Guard are going to be there on Saturday morning. Get ready. Wow. Uh, so that, that was one mechanism. On the funding front, it was a little bit different for us. A lot of the funding came federally uh, through the CARES Act and others, then, then to the state and then to the counties. Um, and we actually declined a fair amount of federal funds from the counties uh, because we wanted that push to the partner agencies that were in those counties. We felt that they could do the best work uh, locally. Back to our point, uh, earlier about diversity. Uh, they know the communities, they know how best to serve those communities. And frankly, we're, we're not set up for um, community specific service. Uh, our obligation is across uh, a 13 county service area. So uh, we actually declined a fair amount of that federal funding. Wow. Others, uh, talk us through how decisions were made around the funding. Yeah, so for yeah, the, so, oh, go ahead. No, Josh, you go first. Okay, I was just gonna say, you know, most of our funding came through the CARES Act um, and, you know, hospitals were, were pretty fortunate with uh, some of the CARE Act funding. Um, early on, of course, THR is a large health system. Um, so most of the evaluation of uh, what to receive, what to hold back, those were made at the corporate level based on the, the, the function of each hospital. Early in the pandemic, um, there was a significant concern about the supply chain. Um, what we saw was once we shut down surgeries, all of a sudden hospitals went dark and I had four units that were completely closed. Um, so uh, one of the things THR agreed to do because we couldn't furlough and let staff go 
is we made them whole and kept their salary while we waited for what Italy showed to be an enormous surge that was coming. And, and we, we kept up with um, all of the other countries and uh, locations that had already gone through this that we were, tra we were tailing behind um, because they said, here's what's gonna happen. You're gonna shut it down. Your hospitals are gonna go dark. You're gonna hemorrhage money then, but you can't let those resources go because you're not only gonna need those, you're gonna need far greater than you have. So use that as time to prepare. And that's what we did. And then um, when the time came and the surge hit, you know, we were prepared for that. Um, then all of a sudden it looked like our revenue situation was getting much better because we saw far more volume than we had anticipated. Then the corporate office starts clawing some of that, that funding back saying, okay, now we've got to figure out because we're going to have to account for, for every dollar. Uh, and we recognize that there's going to be audits. And at the end of the day, we don't want to be giving back a big portion of this that we held uh, when we, we potentially did not need that. Um, so we've gone through these various life cycles of, you know, um, uh, major expenses. Um, you know, we're paying right now premium dollars for uh, contract nurses and staff and respiratory therapists just to keep afloat. Um, so our expenses have accelerated pretty substantially, but it's this delicate balance because as volume comes in and then volume would go out and then volume would come back with a vengeance, it's that delicate balance of always wanting to be prepared, um, but being fiscally responsible with, with federal dollars that were coming in. So um, at the, uh, we were on constant calls and did a ton of projections using a lot of UT Southwestern data. And then many of those that came before us who could tell us what to expect. And we just use those models constantly. And we're using those models every single day still to plan and prepare and project what's going to be needed. Awesome. Sarah, Mark, or Mark, I guess you were about to go before Josh. Sure. Well, for us, we, we've accepted uh, both the, the CARES funds and we've had ARPA funds. And I think it's important for everybody to understand that federal dollars don't come without strings or restrictions. And so as Josh mentioned, um, there are specific uses that, that you have to use these for. And should you not use them for those, you have to repay those dollars. So you have to account for it, you have to track it, you have to be able to prove up uh, exactly what those dollars are used for. So we, we spent uh, quite a bit of time um, at the beginning of the pandemic with small business loans and rental, rental relief funds, uh, working with Collin County to in some of our neighboring communities. We actually had our own um, small business uh, grants area to, to be able to provide businesses. And so the focus was trying to provide relief for those that were going through economic hardship and trying to make sure that they could get through uh, the pandemic, keep their doors open, keep the rent being paid, um, things like that. And so our focus on uh, a lot of those funds was for relief and assistance uh, in the community. But there was also the aspect, as Josh mentioned, um, as a governmental entity, we do collect taxes. And so that does happen. Uh, but we saw our revenues uh, decline pretty precipitously uh, through that. And we want to make sure as we're providing our services that there is continuity of service. Uh, as a public entity, uh, our citizens count on us from everything from the toilets flushing and roads being open and lights working and public safety being provided, uh, making sure there's that continuity provides stability um, to the community. And so we focused on those things as well. Um, but where there was uh, the ability to provide some of that relief to our small businesses and to our citizens that had uh, the need for rental assistance, things like that, uh, we did have those programs. They were very successful, um, and we felt like that provided an opportunity for, for some of those folks to, um, to receive uh, timely assistance. All right. I, I'm actually, Sarah, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm not going to let you answer that question only because I want to respect people's time. Um, and we said we're going to end at eight o'clock, but I do want to hear one last thing from each of you. First of all, let me just say, I want to, I want to affirm. Um, I heard some things tonight. It was, it was in that category of like, man, I didn't even know about that. That's the thing that we should be celebrating in the media, unless I just missed it on the news. Like um, Josh, when you just said you, you made sure that employees that weren't necessarily being utilized in the area of expertise stayed fully employed early on in the pandemic. I think that was that was huge. Um, 
to hear you, Brad, say that you actually, where you normally relied on volunteers, decided to actually hire some people because you not only could, but you needed to. Um, Sarah, some of the things that you talked about in terms of that welcome center for new families that need help, this kind of one-stop shop um, is pretty amazing. I think you all on this panel, uh, it's fair to say you're leaders in this community that are setting the bar pretty high when it comes to agility and ingenuity. There are people who are watching, some who will watch this after the fact because it's recorded, who are leading in their own right. Maybe not organizations as big as yours, but they're having to make decisions, realizing that they can't please all the people all the time. So as a parting word before we wrap up, um, close to on time, I guess, what would you say to the person watching who's leading something and is having to continue to make tough decisions during these times that are rapidly changing? Give a word of encouragement, mentorship, guidance to a leader who's watching, whoever wants to go first. I'll go. I would say just know who you are, know what your values are and follow them vigorously. That's right. it. Uh, and if you do that and, and you know, you, there's nothing to be afraid of and you'll be issued grace when you make missteps. Awesome. Yeah. And I would say, you know, when in looking back, um, you know, every company has a mission statement. Um, they have a, a vision and a direction. They have a set of values. Um, Nothing gets tested more greatly than the list of values you hang on the wall when there comes time for there to be a disaster. And they're looking for the wheels to fly off, things to fall apart. Um, what you wanna do is exude confidence. You don't want them to feel if they ever see the leader falling apart, they have no hope that we're gonna get through this. So they need strength. They need to see that you're resilient. They need to see you present, um, but more than anything else, they need to see that you're leading towards the mission of the hospital. Or uh, for us, it's you know we're here to take care of people, and if we're not making good decisions that are going to open up more resources and take care of more people more efficiently, and if we're not doing so following our values, um, then it's real quick. They're real quick to begin to not trust. And so you have to be able to do it. Got it. I love it. Know who you are. Know your values. Exude confidence. Sarah, Mark, what would you say? I, 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 I feel the same way. I, you know, I started my whole conversation with the vision statement. Excellence, caring, learning, proud. You know, if, if you can filter your decisions through those values, then you will make better decisions. And, and as a team, you know, it's, you know, that none of this happened alone. The, surrounded by people helping filter filter decisions through those lenses uh, and when you do that then students really are at the heart of your decisions and we will do right by kids and for us that was the that was the litmus test every time awesome mark you get the last leadership lesson before i close it out uh, i i completely agree with stay true to you your values your organization's values stay true to your mission um, but the one lesson I'd also, the one tip I would give is all of these are community partners. We all know each other. Um, if you go into a crisis and you don't know who your partners are and you haven't invested in those relationships, you're going to be working uh, from behind. So develop those critical relationships, develop those people that you can call um, because you're not at that point when you're leading, you're not in it alone. And you're working with people that will help be a force multiplier for your organization. So build relationships because they matter. Awesome. Well, hey, um, I know that we had one question that uh, we didn't get to in the Q&A. And, um, you know, I think that uh, it's, a, it's a forecasting question. It's really just a matter of, will the spike that's coming related to COVID be as bad as the one we had in July of 2020? Um, I don't want to speak for you, Josh. Um, I don't know if you have a quick one word answer or, or, or a sentence answer to that. And then I'll say final words. Yeah, I cut that out of the presentation because I saw I had way too many slides. So um, UT Southwestern's current projection is that this is going to continue to surge upward for another two to three weeks. Um, just to give you an idea, so when the UK dealt with the Delta variant, um, they saw between around 50 days before they plateaued and started to come down, 
Um, we're day roughly 46. Um, and we're tracking a little bit differently than them, about the same vaccination rate. Um, so we're looking at, that's when I was saying earlier, we use all these different models and we're looking at all these different countries and other, the way other people have, um, have handled the situation and what their numbers did. It looks like we probably still have a couple more weeks of it going up. Um, but if it follows suit, the Delta variant plateaus quick and it comes back down quick. Right. So I'm holding out hope. All right. Well, hey, let me say <laughs> on behalf of MCOR, the Multicultural Outreach Roundtable, we are deeply appreciative to each of you giving us time this evening to share your insight and your wisdom. As I share with you um, in this uh, webinar and also beforehand, this is really a spirit of celebration. We want to say well done. We know that leadership is not easy. Um, we realize that you have a lot of inputs coming at you. And so on behalf of MCOR, I just wanna say thank you. And then there's a slide up for our attendees. We wanna say thank you for tuning in. Thank you for your questions. Uh, if you have any interest in what the Multicultural Outreach Roundtable is all about, you can certainly go to the website that's on the screen there, planomcore.org. Uh, there's no fees involved. I'm involved just as a, a local church pastor and a, a community member that's intrigued by this diversity in this community that we live in and really feel like when you get a lot of different voices around the table, uh, we can come together and try and problem solve how to best make this community uh, an even greater community of excellence. So I hope that you will take a next step to get involved in MCOR in some way. And with that, I wanna say good night. Thank you for joining this webinar. We'll see you later.